Hello, everyone, and welcome to session two of the 2020 Pathways to Law Conference. My name is Pamela Chung, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Community Services Committee of the Asian American Bar Association of the Greater Bay Area. ABBA was founded in 1976, and it is one of the largest Asian American Bar Associations in the nation. ABBA is where Asian and Pacific Islander attorneys can go to seek mentorship and guidance for our careers. It's where we can network and develop relationships and where we can serve the greater community. The purpose of this conference is to provide you with advice and insights from Asian and Pacific Islander attorneys. This year, Pathways to Law is taking place as a weekly series of live stream panels that you can watch on YouTube. Today's panel is the second in the series, and it features attorneys who are practicing in the public interest and public law sectors. I'm excited to introduce you to our moderator, Amit Kurlikar. Amit is Deputy Attorney General who handles criminal appeals at the California Attorney General's office. He also teaches legal research and writing at UC Hastings College of the Law. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Amit. Thanks for that introduction, Pam. I'm so happy to be here and to be joined by our accomplished panelists. Alex Say is a United States Magistrate Judge based in San Francisco. Before becoming a judge, Alex spent over 20 years in the United States Attorney's Office and the City Attorney's Office for San Francisco. Jonathan Metha Stein is the Executive Director of the Democracy Reform Nonprofit Organization, California Common Cause. He was formerly the head of the Voting Rights and Census Program at Asian Law Caucus and a Voting Rights Attorney at the ACLU of California. Genevieve Goldman is a prosecutor in the District Attorney's Office for Contra Costa County. Genevieve has also worked for the District Attorney's Offices in Orange County, San Mateo County, and San Francisco. I'd like to start by thanking all of you for coming and joining us. We're very excited by the level of interest in being a public lawyer. We also encourage you to send questions as they come to you throughout the presentation. This will be more interesting for all of us if we know what all of you want to discuss. If you do post a question, please give us an opportunity to respond and we'll get to as many of the questions as we can. But for now, I'd like to start by asking our panelists to put themselves back in the shoes of where most of you are today, which is in high school or college. And I wanna start by asking Magistrate Judge Say, uh, Your Honor, how sure were you about being a lawyer when you went to high school or college? Um, actually, let me, uh, let me actually direct that question right now to, uh, to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, w when you were in high school or college, what were you thinking about, about being a lawyer? Uh, thanks, Amit. Um, I was 0% sure that I wanted to be a lawyer, um, when I was in high school and even when I was in college. Um, I did mock trial, I did speech and debate, I think like so many future lawyers, um, but I, uh, didn't, I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't have any lawyers in my family. I didn't have any lawyers that were friends of the family. I didn't know what being a lawyer meant. Um, and uh, my passion was was English and reading and writing. And um, so I was an English major in college, um, which actually, I mean, has served me well as a lawyer because it, it set with such a heavy, heavy emphasis on reading and writing. But my goal at that time was to write the great American novel and to make my living uh, writing. And as it turns out, I sort of do make my living writing because lawyers write constantly. Um, but I thought I'd be writing short fiction and poetry and um, I had no idea I would end up here. Genevieve, how about you? Uh, when you were in uh, college, uh, high school and college, were you thinking of being a lawyer? Thanks, Amit. And yes, since I was in high school, I knew that I wanted to go to law school. And that's because uh, since I was young, I really enjoyed reading and writing. Um, I enjoyed public speaking and I was very interested in law and government. So um, in college, I majored in political science and sociology, which like Jonathan mentioned, um, those kind of majors uh, require a significant amount of reading and writing. And so um, that's what you'll be doing in law school. And when I was in high school, um, I knew that I also wanted to uh, gear my um, career towards public service. So I interned for a California state senator in high school. And then in college, I interned for the Orange County District Attorney's Office. And those experiences helped me help confirm my 
my my belief that I, I do want to go to law school and become a lawyer. Great. And then uh, Majri Judge Say, same question to you. Um, how sure were you that you wanted to be a lawyer back when you were in high school and college? So I, I, similar to the panelists, I think I knew early on in high school that I was interested in law. I did not necessarily know what that meant. I similarly didn't have any, you know, access to people who, other than TV, you know, what a lawyer did or what they wanted to do or what they could do. And so um, it was an interest that I had generally, and I just continued to pursue um, some externships uh, during the school year in college and ultimately uh, went to law school. And I, I think like others that I've heard on this panel, um, being deba a debater in high school kind of was a natural pull into that world, even though it's very different. Yeah, I, I was a debater too in high school. And, and like uh, John and Genevieve, my, my major in college was philosophy. And I thought that really prepared me for, for law school because it made me an analytical thinker. I was wondering, Magistrate Judge, say, did, you know, like I said, uh, Genevieve and Jonathan talked about their majors. What was your major, and did you feel like it helped you in in your future legal career? Sure. So there's actually some uh, history to that. Um, I went to Cal, and and the deal that I made with my parents to let me go is from Seattle back in the 1980s was that I was gonna be some computer science major, which was of course nothing that I ever wanted to do. And I ultimately majored in econ as a compromise to my parents um, that I was going to get a job out of college if, I, if this law thing didn't work out. So for those of you who might come from families that they're a little suspicious and a little bit uncertain by your career choice. Um, I still think you got to go with what you want to do. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I definitely felt like to my parents, maybe to myself a little bit that I needed to, to choose a major that, you know, I could get some kind of job in case law school didn't work out. Um, but I, I ended up taking a lot of classes in philosophy and Asian American studies and um, poli sci. So, um, so I, I feel like I, 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 I was able to accomplish both things, a, a hopefully practical major, whatever that means, um, and take classes that I was interested in. So Alex, your experience sounds so much like mine. I remember my parents, uh, they wanted me to be a doctor. And uh, I was actually pre-med my first two years in, in college. I went through the whole bio core uh, at Stanford. And it was only by, I guess, threatening them by uh, to pursue a career in uh, academia, uh, in philosophy academia, that, that, that I finally got them to accept that I was going to be a lawyer. Um, but, but, you know, it, it all turned out okay. Um, so I know one question that, pe that college students have before they go to law school is, should I take time off? If so, how much? Um, I'm kind of curious as to, you know, all of you, if you took time off, and uh, if so, whether you felt like it helped, uh, wh whatever your decision was, whether it helped or, or, or hindered you. And uh, this time, uh, let's start with Genevieve. Yeah, so I, I'm i glad I took one year off um, between college and law school. And I spent my time preparing for the LSAT and taking the LSAT, which was nice because I got to focus solely on that. And um, after I took the LSAT, I got a job at a big law firm in San Francisco. And I think going into law school and having um, experience in the legal field, having a full-time job before school, I think was very um, helpful and insightful. And it um, helped me learn about uh, what kind of law I did want to practice and didn't want to practice. And it also gave me something else to add to my resume and uh, write in my personal statement. So I'm, I'm really glad that I took some time off to explore the legal field more before I went into law school. That's great. Um, how about you, uh, Magistrate Judge Say? So I did not take any time off, um, and uh, that is something that I um, I would have done. There's there's no replacement for um, some world real life experience, um, and all I knew at the time was you know whatever externships I had over the summer and um, 
and how to study. Um, and that's about it. And I, I really do think that I, um, uh, I would have taken time off. And again, at, the, at that time in my life and in, in that generation, my, my parents were like, you need to go to school. Uh, you're never going to go back to school. And so I knew no better. Um, but I do think that an opportunity So we've uh, temporarily lost Master Judge today. Let me just ask um, Jonathan to, to give his, his thoughts. Sure. And then we actually will go on to our first first, first question from the audience. Sure. I, I took four years off between undergrad and grad school. And I actually got an MPP and a JD. I started my MPP, a master's in public policy first. So technically speaking, I took five years between undergrad and, and law school. And I can't endorse that more highly. I think it's critically important. I talk to young people all the time who have a sense that they want to go to law school. Well, let's say they're college students who um, are political science majors and they love politics or they're high school debaters. And they think, you know, I do debate and mock trial. I'm a perfect fit for going to law school. And I'll ask them, what, what do you want to do with your law degree? Um, and their answer usually is, well, I just I'm interested in the law and in debating and in politics, and I'll figure out what I want to do when I get to law school. And the fact of the matter is that law school is an incredibly expensive way to figure out what you want to do. Um, it's, and it's, it's a difficult and, and sometimes miserable experience. I think we all probably learned a lot and grew a lot in law school, but it's often really, really hard. And, and there are other ways to find out what you're passionate about. Um, I spent four years uh, as a journalist, um, uh, writing about um, various policy issues and political issues. Um, and it was hugely useful for me because I learned um, what I was passionate about in the world. And I got paid to learn that thing um, uh, as opposed to going to law school where I was paying someone else to learn what I was passionate about. And when I got to law school, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew why I was there. I knew what professors to meet. I knew what student organizations to join. I knew what classes to take. I think I made better and more efficient use of my law school experience because I had taken the time beforehand to figure out why I was there and what I was passionate about. Uh, so Jonathan, you mentioned that law school can be somewhat of an arduous process sometimes. I think that perfectly sets up uh, our first question. Uh, someone told one of our listeners that in California, you don't have to go to law school to become a lawyer. And uh, certainly, I, I'll just sort of take this one because it's a pretty quick answer. Uh, yes, that's true. You can be a member of the bar. You can take the bar exam without going to law school. It requires a, an apprenticeship. Um, you should definitely check with the state bar rules and uh, also talk to a career counselor, either at you know, your college or your or your uh or at your college to try and figure out whether that is a path you want to take. But it is, you know, there's no easy path to becoming a lawyer. Either way, you're going to have to study a lot, whether it's in the confines of a law school or whether it's with your apprenticeship. And then you're going to have to take the bar exam, which, of course, is you know, a very time consuming, very difficult project. Um, we do actually have another question, which I think is a very common question uh, for people, even in entering law school, which is, do all lawyers at some point go into court and present a case or does it depend on what kind of lawyer you are? Um, so uh, let me ask, uh, let me ask, uh, you know, magistrate judge say you are in court. Um, do you feel like you see all the lawyers out there in the world in your court? Right. Okay, I think Master Judge say might be still having a little technical, some technical difficulties. So, um, Jonathan, do you want to do you answer that question? Yeah, yeah the answer is. Can no. you hear me? <laughs> oh, go ahead, Master Judge. We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, I think I caught most of the question, uh, which is um, being in court. So, and yes, that's that's all I do. Although right now, um, I'm holding all my appearances over the telephone. So uh, it's a question, what is court? Um, and if, if a, a good chunk of what we think lawyers do is in court, 
And our expectation is, as a law student and as a lawyer, is that I'm not a lawyer unless I go into court. Um, the reality is that's not true. Uh, most of the lawyering that happens actually happens not in court. Um, it happens behind the scenes and um, a good chunk of cases settle before they ever hit trial. So, and that's north of 90%. So most of the work actually is done uh, in litigation outside of court. And then of course there, there's corporate lawyers who, who I don't think they go into court. Um, can I add to that? Please do. I think that when people, young people are drawn to the law, it's because of this archetype of the sort of powerful orator lawyer, the Atticus Finch figure who um, uh, extracts justice for clients um, through the power of their words. Uh, and if you do speech and debate or you do mock trial, um, you're, you're, you're probably sort of getting a taste of that and it's very alluring. I have to say, though, that the vast majority of lawyering is done sitting at a desk and you're doing legal research, you're reading dense legal documents, and then you're trying to synthesize those and write, you know, other dense legal documents. Um, so uh, while you might be thinking to yourself, I love public speaking, I love debates, I love arguing about politics with my family, my friends, this makes me perfect to be a lawyer. In actual fact, you better love research, you better love writing, you better love being detail oriented. The set of things that make a good lawyer are often very different from the set of things that draw people to the law. And, and I'll say conversely, I know when I'm teaching my, my incoming 1Ls, some of them ask, can I be a lawyer? I'm deathly afraid of walking into a courtroom public speaking. And that's, that's the thing. There's certainly a career for you there too. Transactional lawyers, as, as magistrate judge said, it's, it's sort of half of the law. Half of the law is not litigation where you, you, you make deals, you try, you draft contracts. So there's a whole world for people who don't like the public speaking and don't want to go into court and, and talk. Um, it, it, Genevieve, as someone who recently, more recently came out of law school, um, although not during this crisis, we do have a question from someone asking, what advice would you give to college students getting ready to pursue law amid the current crisis? Do you think there's any sort of uh, special ways that you would adapt your law school search or anything? You know, you can't visit campuses right now. Um, how do you think you would approach it now? Yeah, so now with um, we're lucky to have, you know, these virtual opportunities like this one now. So I think this is a great um, opportunity to take advantage of and to continue, you know, seeking out um, other events like this where you can get to hear from attorneys and maybe build connections with these panelists and, um, you know, look for someone who can mentor you, someone who you could see uh, yourself um, being in the future. Like if you want to be a deputy district attorney, I'd be happy to, you know, speak with you after this panel. So just, just really being proactive and trying to meet as many attorneys as you can virtually right now. Um, hopefully when this um, shelter in place and COVID is under control, you know, I would really recommend, you know, trying to get internships. Um, for my office, I know that we are still offering internships, um, even though we're in a shelter in place. And so just just be um, just be proactive and try to seek as many legal opportunities as you can, whether that's you know, at a law firm or at, um, you know, a DA's office. And it's, you know, it's up, it's up to you to really take control of your future. So that's my advice. Uh, Jonathan, I actually have a question for you. Uh, one of our listeners is debating doing an MPP or a joint JD program and wonders what is the main difference in the jobs that you can do with either degree and would you recommend a joint degree program? I think Jonathan's, I think Jonathan might have frozen. So we will, I definitely want to hear his perspective on this. So we will actually ask, um, actually, I'm going to ask uh, Magistrate Judge Say, um, how did you decide what kind of law you wanted to practice? Um, as a high schooler, the listener feels like they don't know enough about the different kinds of law. Uh, for sure. In high school, you don't know. Um, you, you really only have, unless you come from a family of lawyers or have a lot of access to lawyers, it's unlikely that you'll have a, a true sense of what it is. And that's okay. Um, I think most of us start off in our careers, even in law, um, 
and, and go through a process of elimination. I do think that the most important thing is to figure out, do you want to be a litigator or do you rather be a business person or in, in transactional work? Um, because those are two very, very different worlds. Um, and, and generally speaking, a litigator is probably where you get really strong skills. So, and most of the jobs are probably available in the litigation realm. And for me, it was always, I always gravitated to litigation um, in, in part because of the courtroom kind of draw and then also public sector. So starting in college, I worked at, um, I worked at the law department in Seattle um, and um, at, over the summer and in law school, I was an intern at the US attorney's office. Um, and then I went to private practice for four years. But when I got back into the public sector, which is where I have always wanted to be, um, it's where I've stayed and, and continue to, to do work in that area. Um, but it is a process of elimination. I don't think you should worry if you're in high school, you know, uh, that I need to find out exactly what kind of lawyer I want to be. And, and it seems that um, there's a, uh, a need to specialize or a need to differentiate yourself from others. And um, that's not the time to do it. The, the time to do it is actually to get as much experience as you can with a variety of experiences and, and talking to people and figuring out what their lives are like as a lawyer. And uh, Jonathan, uh, now you're uh, you're back. I don't know if you heard the full question about the the, the MPP versus JD joint JD program. Uh, I did. Okay. I did. Yeah. I apologize for dropping off. I, um, so an MPP is a fascinating um, if you want to go create change in the world. Um, uh, if you have an interest in um, governments and moving legislation. Uh, through uh, Congress in DC or in um, state government, or you want to work. Um, unfortunately, like Jonathan is, is frozen again. So uh, we'll take another question. Uh, we will try our hardest to get him to, to, get, him to get his answer to this question uh, at some point during the during this presentation. But uh, we have a question that actually that I think is is good for all of our panelists because the answer will be so different for all of us. Uh, Genevieve, let's start with you. What does your workload look like um, sort of on a, on a day week basis? However you, however you sort of think about metering it out. Yeah, so my workload is very busy um, I, and fast paced because I manage a large misdemeanor caseload. And so um, every day is different. Um, and I know this ties back to the previous question about um, do all lawyers go to court? So as me as a prosecutor, I go to court every week, um, sometimes every day for a whole week, depending on what my schedule is. Um, but uh, yeah, so I write motions, I argue motions, I appear on pretrial conferences to negotiate um, pleas with the defense attorney and with the judge. And um, I'm preparing for trial that entails, you know, working with victims, witnesses, and police officers. And then when I'm in trial, I'm in front of a judge and a jury. So yes, it's very, um, my workload is very, uh, very busy, but uh, that's what makes it for me really enjoyable and challenging because it's just very fast paced and exciting and I find uh, the work I do very rewarding as well. And, and before turning it over to Magic Judge Say, I'm just going to say a little about my workload because I'm a litigator, I'm actually a criminal litigator uh, like Genevieve, but at the opposite end. So she does the trial work, I do appeals. So I am the opposite of fast paced. I have six or seven appeals sitting on my desk at any given time. They all have uh, weeks to write. So I have a week to write, or, I mean, multiple weeks uh, to write a brief that's been given to me. So each project, it's not like Genevieve where I'm sort of flying around talking to people, trying to gather evidence. Uh, I am, uh, I'm sitting at my desk, I'm researching, I'm writing. And although at any given time I'm busy in the sense that I have a lot of things due over the next several months uh, to keep me busy, the pace of the work is sort of at my own pace. And that's you know, especially with small kids, that's that's definitely something that's that's worked out well for me. But also, it's my personality too. Um, yeah, Magistrate Judge, say you obviously are a judge. Uh, I think that that your workload 
is, is especially, you know, it's gonna be different bars. If you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Uh, right. Uh, wor workload in my various, I mean, I've been practicing law for almost 30 years now. So I've, I've been at, at various ends of the spectrum. Um, one thing is constant, though. It's the law is not a 40 hour a week job. Um, you might not work 40 hours a week and you might work up to 80 hours a week. Um, it depends on the, on the need and uh, the issue. When you're in trial, you're working long hours, weekends, preparing for trial. Um, and um, when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office and when, in fact, I was the U.S. Attorney, you know, one of the issues was how to keep a balanced workload. Um, and that's oftentimes very challenging to make sure that nobody has too much. Um, the, the law is something that, quite frankly, you can, it can absorb all of your time. Um, it's, 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 a, it's both an art and a science. Um, and it, it takes a lot of commitment to, to work through. So it's hard to pin down that I only work 40 hours. My, my experience right now, um, I'm on criminal duty this month, uh, which means I'm on call 24-7. Um, so, um, and I don't know when search warrant's going to come in um, and uh, that I have to review and swear out the FBI agent so they can execute on the search warrant. Um, so things things change, um, and as a lawyer, uh, now I'll say corporate and uh, litigation corporate lawyers might have a tremendous workload depending upon the event. If there's a corporate deal that has to happen, they're working around the clock. So um, it's it's a profession that I will I will end with this, and I I, I tell people entering the profession, um, you have to want to be a lawyer because it will require the time and effort um, uh, in order to do a good job, uh, that you're gonna have to do a lot of your own personal resources and the resources of your family. Um, uh, you're gonna be drawn away from your family uh, to do the work. And so it is something that time management skills are very important, um, but ultimately you have to wanna be a lawyer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, we did have a uh, our next question. We have a couple of related questions uh, from someone, which are uh, this person. This person doesn't have any family members or family friends who were attorneys and feels like a disadvantageous in, in her sort of pursuit of legal career. Uh, wants to know if any of us were in a similar situation and, and how we overcame it. As I mentioned, my parents were initially not supportive of me being a lawyer. Uh, Indian lawyers weren't that common. Indian American lawyers weren't that common in the 90s uh, relative to, to everyone else. And uh, it definitely just took me really trying to persuade them that this is what I really wanted to do and that I was not going to be happy or as successful in doing anything else. I think in the end, uh, a lot of um, family members and friends really want you to be successful. And their initial discouragement, I think, can be just sort of their way of, of ensuring that you are successful. Uh, and not sort of going down a different path. I also know that law schools do have, or some law schools do have organizations for um, people, for law students who are in particular, the first professionals in their families, the first lawyers in their families. So that's also a good resource. Uh, Genevieve, did you, you know, were, did you have a strong network of, of, of lawyers in your family or friend network? When, and, and if not, how did you overcome that? So I did not. Um, I don't have any um, lawyers in my family. Um, the only lawyer that I do have in my family, um, she's also a prosecutor, but I didn't find that out until after I graduated law school. And so um, for me, you know, I, I didn't really know, um, I didn't have that many resources in, you know, in high school to help me figure out, you know, what should I be doing? Um, and I didn't even know about these organizations like ABBA 
or um, other legal organizations. And so um, my advice to everyone out there who don't know any lawyers right now, who don't have any lawyers in the family, that's okay because there are so many resources out there like the Asian American Bar Association. And so um, that is really important to, um, to seek out, just like you're doing right now, and um, to find people like when you when you intern at a law firm or at you know any legal office to, to really get to know those people and to see if you know any of them are willing to be your mentors because for me having mentors even if they weren't you know in my family or even Asian American it was really beneficial for me and helping me decide whether or not I wanted to become a lawyer. And then, uh, Jonathan, the question that we're currently on is uh, a question about whether you had uh, whether you had attorneys in your family or friend network when you decided to go to law school. And if not, how did you overcome that sort of lack of familiarity, uh, cultural familiarity, if you will, with the with law? Yeah, thanks. I mean, and apologies for my Wi-Fi. Um, God bless Genevieve's Wi-Fi for uh, really keeping this thing together. Um, uh, I had no lawyers in my family. I had no lawyers in my immediate circle. Um, uh, I, uh, my mom is Indian American, um, and uh, she has a family that do a range of things, but a lot of them are doctors, and a lot of them work in tech. Um, and uh, my dad comes. My dad is white, but he comes from a family that has no experience with the law. No one, no one gone anywhere near the law. Um, and for me, it was really a matter of talking to people in the nonprofit. I knew I wanted to be an advocate. I knew I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector. I had some a broad sense early on that I wanted to make the world a better place and drive social and political change. And so I talked to people who were having the careers that I wanted to have someday. And I asked them if they had a law degree. And um, if they didn't, did they wish they had a law degree? And if they did, did they feel like it was necessary for them to have the law degree? Or do they wish they'd gotten a different degree? For a lot of careers in the nonprofit sector, um, you can get a master's in public policy or you can get a master's in education if you want to do education policy or a master's in public health if you want to do health policy or a master's in environmental resources if you want to do climate change action and environmental advocacy. Um, there's a lot of ways to go in the nonprofit and advocate sector that don't involve a law degree. And so I had to talk to a number of people to figure out you know, what degree was necessary for the career I wanted to have. There's a related question from the same questioner, which is, did you feel, how did you feel like your, your Asian American background impacted your pursuit of a legal career? Did you feel like in any place it helped you or if it hampered you? Um, what sort of obstacles did you face or also what sort of advantages did you have? And Jonathan, if you just want to continue, that'd be great. Sure. Um, without question, uh, being Asian American, having an immigrant mom um, uh, awakened in me an awareness of issues of race um, around civil rights, um, around immigration and uh, the, the rights of, of immigrant Americans. Um, uh, I owe a lot of what I do to my mom. I have a very strong, I'll just be personal about this. I mean, I have a very strong memory from the 1992 presidential election. I was a young kid and my brother was even younger than I was. And my mom, um, my memory of this is hazy. Maybe I have this wrong, but in my head, my mom was a working mom. She dropped us off at the Clinton Gore campaign office in 1992. She told us she, we were going to stuff envelopes and lick stamps and she'd be back in four or five hours to pick us up. And um, it awakened in me a sense that um, participation mattered um, and that we need, and, and my mom, looking back on it later, my mom was not a naturalized citizen um, in 1992. She didn't have the ability to vote in that election, but she still had a sense that uh, she could make a difference and that even as a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, we could make a difference. Um, and I've always carried this sense that we need a democracy that hears all voices, including um, those from our immigrant communities, from low-income communities, from communities of color and so on. And so um, the reason I do the work that I do, which is all about building an inclusive democracy, is really tied up with the fact um, the, the, tied up in my sort of the, the immigrant background of my family. Actually, Judge Say, how about um, how about you? Did you how did you feel your you know your your background uh, factored into either either obstacle? I don't know if you can. Well, let me go to you, Genevieve. Uh, how uh, how did you feel your your uh, Asian American background factored into your pursuit of legal career? Yeah, so my parents are, um, they were born and raised in the Philippines. And so 
um, when they first came to America in their 20s, um, they, you know, experienced racism. And, it, you know, and, and my mom is a dentist, and my dad's an engineer. And you know, this is my dad, he experienced, you know, some racism in the work in the workplace. And so just growing up hearing about that and hearing, you know, other people's stories about, you know, you know, not just Asian, but Asians, you know, African Americans, Hispanics, what they've gone through in the, uh, in the workforce, in the workplace, you know, in regards to discrimination or racism, I think really was another factor in making me want to become an attorney. And knowing that there aren't many minority attorneys, um, I think that was another reason why I, I wanted to be an attorney. And so that, that actually play, yeah, played a big role in me pursuing law because I wanted to, you know, break out of that. I wanted to show the world that, um, that the stereotype of the quiet Asian female is not, doesn't apply, that it's, that that's just a stereotype. And I wanted to prove to everybody that, you know, Asian females or Asians in general, we can, we are also, we can be outspoken. We can, you know, take initiative and be proactive and be leaders. And growing up, I didn't see that um, in our community. I didn't see any Asian American leaders. And so when I found these organizations like ABBA and FA and NAPIPA, I, uh, I just felt even more empowered, you know, being a, an Asian female attorney. Great. Uh, Imagine Judge Say, I, I don't know if you've been able to hear the question, but essentially I'm, it's, sorry? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I've been trying and it's my audio has been pretty degraded, but I, I, I think I have the general sense of um, what this question is. And um, I, I'm sad to have missed the, the panelists responses to it. Um, but the, uh, the, it, I, I have to say unequivocally, you know, being an Asian American, um, is at the forefront of every aspect of my career in that um, every everybody views me through the lens of being an Asian American. And, and that's fine. Uh, that's not, it's immutable. It's not going to change. Um, but you just have to be aware of it. And, um, and, you know, I always tell junior lawyers um, that the most important aspect about this um, is to do good work because nobody can ever take that away from you. And that's actually something that, you know, my parents always instilled in me to do. And I'm sure our families are, are have motivated us to do well and to achieve. Um, and that ultimately is something that will last and you can take from job to job, experience to experience, um, and nobody can ever take that away. And that's the only variable that you control. Um, everything else, how people might perceive you as an Asian American, you don't necessarily control. Um, and there are times uh, that are going to be very challenging because of that. Um, but in, especially if you're going into the public sector where you're, you know, likely to be more visible in some ways, um, uh, it's going to be something that you're going to be aware of um, every day. Um, and it's not something that you just can check and check at the door when you leave your home. Um, thank you for, for those perspectives, uh, all of you. I, I do have, there, there's a couple of questions that have to do with college majors, which we discussed a little bit earlier. And uh, I'm just going to, um, I, I'm going to, one of the questions was about how you picked your college major, if that was, you know, if that was sort of, the law factors into that. And then, um, but relatedly, I think people have perceived that there's a lot of liberal arts majors in law school and, and, and somebody is concerned, what if you have a more technical, you know, engineering, finance, something like that. So um, let's start with, uh, with with you this time, Jonathan. Do you, do you have any thoughts as to tailoring your major or being afraid to have, take a major, a certain major? For sure. There's no right major to be uh, a future lawyer. Uh, do what interests you. I think, um, Magistrate Judge Say has already talked about this a little bit. Do what you're passionate about. Explore. Um, uh, pursue different interests. Uh, I promise you there is no um, 
right box you check on a law school application that, that indicates, like, I took the major that makes me qualify for law school. Um, frankly, if you have a, a, a science degree or an economics degree or something that's out of the ordinary, it might distinguish you in the law school uh, process. And frankly, it might open up avenues to parts of the law that the rest of us aren't going to be involved in. There's incredible opportunities in tech law and science law and so on. And as an English major, I'm not qualified to practice in those areas, right? Um, and But maybe if you took a different path, you are. Uh, and so I really think that, that in college, you should be trying to figure out what you're passionate about, what motivates you, what you find interesting, and learning as much as possible about subject matter and about yourself. And it'll all be fine in the law school application process. So, I mean, I'll say that as a, you know, as a professor who has a rolling body of students every year, I have a wide gamut of, of majors and there's no correlation whatsoever between what they studied in college and how they do it, 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 even in legal writing, which is a writing intensive, uh, writing intensive class, obviously, you'll see that everyone has different strengths. You know, some people who are more used to prose writing, uh, they might be better writers in sort of a technical sense, but my engineers might be better at being very, very efficient, very, being very precise in their writing. So I think everyone has skills they learn that they bring uh, to law school. So yeah, I, I completely can, you know, concur with, with what both the magistrate judge and what Jonathan said in terms of just follow your passion. That'll actually make you the most successful. Um, we want to go back, some next question goes back even a little farther, which talks, which asks about uh, high school experience. What can someone do, whether it's taking classes, internships, job shadowing? If you're a high school student and you think you're just in law, what sorts of things do you think you can do to prepare uh, for law school? And Genevieve can, can ask you to sort of take this question. Sure. And so I, what I did in high school was pursued what I was passionate about, like, uh, like your honor mentioned, you know, follow your passion. And so in high school, I was very interested in, like I said, law and government and getting involved in the community. And so I just, I went out there and I volunteered at different um, organizations. I volunteered for a, I interned for a California state senator and that really opened my eyes to what having a, uh, what having a law degree can do um, you know, for your community. And so my advice is just to, to really pursue what you're interested in and whether that's you know volunteering for um, you know at, at nonprofits or for a senator or for you know even working at a law firm, whatever you can do to figure out what you're passionate about, that is that is the best thing you can do for you now while while you're in high school. And I know that there are challenges right now, you know, especially if you're a junior or a senior. Um, so again, just virtually, just email you know whoever you can, like just build your network with um, you know, with attorneys or whatever you're interested in in pursuing, whatever careers you're interested in pursuing. And I think that, you know, you can overcome these challenges during during COVID. Great. Um, somebody is asking about your advice on getting that first law firm internship because they are concerned that you need some kind of experience before you can get your first internship, but you can't get the experience unless you have that first internship. And um, I will ask uh, Magistrate Judge Say, uh, what do you think? What would be your advice on, on what sort of first job should you look for in terms of legal field uh, and in terms of setting up sure. success in future endeavors? Um, the, we, we are heading into a period of uncertainty and especially in private practice. Um, the, the issue will be when we come out of this in, in, our, in a post-COVID world, what does the job market look like? And um, it's going to be very challenging for law students who are just graduating from law school, getting that entry-level position. So if you're a high school student, um, I wouldn't hold the expectation that you're going to, you know, have your your pick of jobs in a law firm. But I would still try because there there is a there is a a an area where you might be able to volunteer and you can help out and it's all administrative and it's all you know maybe helping put exhibits and binders but you can still get an idea of what it's like being in a law firm in the law firm culture um to see if that's something that might be interesting to you um so you just have to understand that the law firm is a business and they're matching your skills to where they can fit you in um and as a law student you know you you really don't have a lot of skills yet and you're going to learn those skills when you're on the job 
Um, your skill is to read and to write. And, um, you know, the more that you can offer and demonstrate to a law firm that, you know, those are your strengths, um, you know, that you, you might have more success in, in getting those jobs. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so, um, you know, focused on I have to get into a law firm and I have to get in before I graduate from law school. There, there might be other opportunities for you to get that experience that you can make yourself more marketable um, and and think creatively, especially as we're heading into a period where the, the market might be contracting for, for new lawyers. And that could be, you know, getting experience in a public law office. Um, the challenge there is that there's not a lot of money available in terms of pay. So um, you might have to have some outside funding, whatever that may mean for you. But those that's the challenge of a public sector job is that there's not a lot of uh, financial resources available for that, but again, it's you know to you know to to be mindful and getting experience is important. But I I I wouldn't you know just beat yourself up if you know, if I don't have the right internship, I'm not going to get the right job. I mean, it's we're in an imperfect world right now where that that's not going to be readily available. Um, so just have a little patience uh, in terms of, of gathering that, um, and you might find an opportunity that's going to be completely different. And it's not going to be that I have to go to a law firm, even though that's what um, most people, you know, have done. Um, I, I did that because honestly, at that time, in, that's what graduates did. You go work for a large law firm, um, even though I knew that I didn't want to necessarily do that for a career. And I would just say from the experience of, of my students and from someone who actually does hiring at my office, um, to me, it doesn't necessarily have to be a job in a particular kind of office. It just has, if you're looking for a job that will set you up, really what, they know that you don't necessarily know what you want to do yet or have a fully formed understanding. They understand. Um, the key is, have you done something which will show that you will work hard and that you have an interest in, in some kind of writing? I think no matter what kind of law you do, there is some writing involved. For any job you can come out of there with a writing sample, something that shows that you are you're able to look at issues and kind of put them on paper, I think it, it is helpful. But but yeah, I, I, I agree with Master Judge State completely that I wouldn't stress out about finding the be tailored internship uh, to what you're end up doing. Jonathan, it looks like you have something to say. Yeah, I just wanna I, I just wanna echo this as, as strongly as I can. There is no one right set of high school extracurriculars. There is no one right college major. There is no one right legal internship. Um, there's a lot of paths to getting to where you want to go. Um, and, and frankly, it, if you have sort of a circuitous path, if you've done something different, it might make you more interesting in the application process. Like, I mean, I do hiring uh, for my for my job and in my past job. And if somebody had done something different that made them stand out, it often was a conversation starter. It often led to a human connection. There's lots of people who follow the tight and narrow path to do exactly what's expected. And then you have every once in a while someone who's just as talented, but they took a year longer to get there because they did some really interesting thing. And that's the person that feels humanized when you're in the interview process. So don't feel like you have to nail it at every step in the process. Um, and the last thing I want to add is to Genevieve's point about emailing people. Mentors are so important. Um, and every one of us, had people who helped us along the way. Without question, there were there was one person, two people, six people, who somewhere along the way lent us a hand so that we could begin our careers. And all of us are interested in paying that forward to the next generation of young attorneys who want to build their careers. And so don't be shy about reaching out to people um, and asking for you know, a cup of coffee or a Zoom date or something. Um, it might feel like you're imposing, but in reality, many more people than you realize um, will be willing to lend you advice and, and um, try to help you out. Yeah, so actually there's something that Magistrate Judge Say said in his comments, which has which sort of spurred a, a question from the audience, I think, or it's related to, which is, how did you navigate the cost of law school going into public interest law? I think one of the big deterrents, and I find this all the time when talking to people, law students, one of the deterrents to going into public service is how am I going to afford it with, you know, with the cost of law school? And, uh, you know, I think, I'll start with you, Genevieve, because I think you had to sort of make this decision most recently uh, out of all of us. So what, what was your thought process there? Yeah, so... I, when I was in law school, I made sure to apply to as many scholarships as I could. 
<clears throat> so, you know, getting a scholarship, that scholarship money was helpful, um, but, you know, I, but it's still expensive. And so um, we have this program called um, the Public Interest um, Law Forgiveness Program, PIL. And so if you, that's what I'm doing right now. So if you um, work in the public sector or at a nonprofit for 10 years, um, and then you pay, um, you know, income-based repayment for the next, um, for the 10 years that you are working as a public service um, or public or nonprofit attorney, then um, your loans will be forgiven and not taxed. And so that's a great program. Um, that's something that I learned about while I was in law school. And so for me, I just, I don't really, I don't worry about it too much because I, I just, I would focus on, you know, um, pursuing what I am passionate about. And I think with that money will follow and as, and I mean, I know it's like, it's expensive, but to me it's, it's, it's worth it. So my advice is just to apply, um, apply for scholarships, you know, before and during law school and even after law school, there's some scholarships available and um, to take advantage of every program that's offered for, you know, public interest lawyers. And then uh, I know, Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? I know you've also had a public interest trajectory, so. Yeah, um, Genevieve's right. Hustle as hard as you can for, find every scholarship. Um, there's the big ones that you might know about, but there's also smaller ones. Like, you know, there might be a, uh, Korean American Bar Association of Orange County, and it only it gives five thousand dollars a year to a Korean Amer a junior attorney for or a, a law student who's Korean American from Orange County, and, and it, that might just be right there waiting for you if you find it. Um, there's lots of small pockets of money who can help defray the cost of law school, um, but what you really got to do before you get to law school is investigate that law school's. Uh, support programs for public interest graduates. So a lot of law schools will offer, um, in addition to the federal public uh, interest loan forgiveness program that Genevieve mentioned, they will they will themselves help public interest uh, graduates. If you go into a public interest career, they might help you with your loan repayment plan, um, et cetera. So take the time before, choosing a law school is a really important choice for a lot of reasons. Law schools have different personalities, they have different emphases. You're going to have a very different experience depending on the law school you choose. So it's a choice you want to make carefully under all circumstances. It's particularly true if you're coming from a background where costs are going to be an issue. And I'm guessing, given how expensive law school is, that's most of us. Um, and you want to go into a public interest career where you're not going to be making a ton of money on the back end. Investigate how that law school supports public interest graduates with their loan payments and so on. Because you'll get, um, I think, very different experiences depending on the law school you choose. And then, uh, Magistrate Judge Say, I know you spent some time in private practice, but you've also spent the bulk of your career in, in public service. And I was wondering if you had any additional thoughts. Um, I, I, so what I would say is for those of you who don't know exactly what you're going to do when you graduate from law school and private practice is still an option and it's still an interest, um, my, my suggestion is that you go to private practice. It's a great experience. It's, it's a learning opportunity. But save your money and pay down your loans and to use the opportunity that you have to have a higher income stream to do what you can so that when you are at a point in your career that you might want to explore other opportunities in the public sector um, it won't be such a painful if not cost prohibitive option um, and it's uh, that i honestly has been the greatest change not necessarily for the better um, I'm a product of public schools uh, from from beginning to end, and so, but and now the education that I had, if I were to get that today, it would be completely different. So um, I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to do that. I, I I only spent four years in private practice, and so and I was able to make the transition, um, and um, and it's. It, it, it's it's a complete challenge because especially if you're going to a a true public interest organization their funding is so year by year um and they they really can't uh predict with any certainty what their hiring ability is and that makes finding that job much more difficult um you know the other thing that i know happens in the public sector is it becomes more word of mouth, uh, who you know, you know, to get those limited um, opportunities that aren't advertised the same way. So, um, so it, it's, it's a completely rewarding career, but it, it, it's not without its challenges, both financial 
um, as well as just opportunity wise. And Amit, can I add to that? Please. So um, another benefit of working as a public interest attorney is that from my experience, um, comparing it to my friends who you know, work at big law firms, the work-life balance is much better. And so um, for me, that's really important because family is very, um, you know, a priority for me. And so working in um, at the DA's office, I, yeah, I work really hard, but I still have that work-life balance um, compared to some people I know who work, you know, at big law firms who are working, you know, 70 to 80 hours a week. Um, so it's another thing to think about when deciding what kind of law you want to pursue. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's completely true. I, I spent almost 10 years in private practice and then moved over and they're just completely different. You know, I think I had friends who made lots of money and they never had any time to spend it because they were always in their offices. And I feel like you really have to decide what at, at, at any given stage of your life, what the right fit is for you. Um, you know, and I, I, it's all obviously, you know, I, I was, I was not in a position where I, you know, had a lot of wealth accumulated. So I had to make these kinds of decisions too when I was in law school. So, so I really appreciate the gravity of them. Uh, one thing, Jonathan, that you mentioned earlier, you referred to the um, sort of the right fit for law school, right? Like picking, you know, each law school is different. They each have different fits. We had one question which asked, which is sort of a sub question of this, which is, should you choose a law school in the particular state that you want to practice in? But to what extent should that factor in your calculus? And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, if you go to an elite law school, um, it's going to be a respected degree no matter where you go. Um, so if you go to an elite law school on the West Coast, you're going to be able to find employment opportunities in the East Coast. And, and if you go to an elite law school on the East Coast, the same will be true on the West Coast. Um, now, if you're going to um, if you're if you're not going to one of the like you know super elite law schools that has a name brand across the country, it does help um, because you'll be uh, rooted in a local legal community uh, and you'll have an easier time finding employment opportunities there. Um, I do uh, uh, a lot of state legislative and policy work in my work, um, and so I work in Sacramento a lot and with uh, attorneys in Sacramento and people in and around the um, capital in Sacramento have gone to McGeorge School of Law quite a bit because it's the closest law school to the Capitol and a number of people who are working in the Capitol go there at night um, and as a side program. So there are, to, to some extent, um, for some law schools, there is sort of a regional dynamic and um, you you do get sort of a stronger local network. Um, but you know, uh, if you go to other kinds of law schools, it, it's not a concern. Uh, do you, uh, Magistrate Judge Say, uh, do you have any, any thoughts to add to that? You know, I, I've seen this change. I, I think the legal community in, in the past has been probably less brand oriented than it is now. I think um, that certain jobs are going to be very challenging to get if you don't go to the best law school. And that's just the reality of law. Um, that just might make it more challenging to get the job you, may, you, you want. Um, there is an, an oversupply of very talented lawyers and a limited number of jobs. Um, and so certainly it is, um, there's certain things that are out of your control. I, I think it's, as you, one thing to consider is you're in law school, you're, you're post-college, you're starting to be at a point in your life that you have other Things to consider. You have families, or you have relationships and and personal connections to your community that might uh, make it the most important reason for you to stay or go to a particular law school that's closer to where you live. And that's perfectly fine. And honestly, you can have a successful legal career uh, going to that law school because you've made the decision to uh, you know keep your family intact where you are. And no one's going to challenge you on that. But it, this particular issue, I think, is um, is more um, acute now as as we're heading into not only uh, you know post COVID, but uh, you know it's just it's just another hurdle that might happen when you're hopefully you'll have many options you can choose from many law schools, but to the extent that that is is less and less the case, um, you might have to factor in other things personal. Uh, can I add to that, Amit? Please. 
Um, I just want to note that uh, something that Magistrate Judge Say mentioned really sort of thought for me, which is that just as important as choosing the law school that might be in the right region or the right community, um, there are certain law schools that are strong for certain programs and that might match your interest. So if you're interested in, in IP law, intellectual property law and tech law, you might want to go to a certain law school that, that churns out graduates in that area and that has great programming in, there, in that area. If you're interested in social justice work, there are definitely law schools um, that, that prioritize that. They have faculty who specialize in that. They have a larger community of students who want to emphasize that. They have research institutes and programming in that area. You know, I've worked in places where, um, at social justice nonprofits, where we have like a really strong contingent of lawyers from one particular law school. And, and you know, you wouldn't think to yourself like that would be the law school where a ton of people would go to like an elite legal nonprofit. Well, the fact of the matter is that not, that law school has really, really strong public interest in social justice programming. Um, and so it creates this, you know, a great crop of attorneys passionate about changing the world every year. So investigate the law, your law school options to make sure that it's the right fit for you, your personality, your interests, and the career you want to have. So thank you, Jonathan. And uh, I think we, we are going to sort of wrap up now. We, um, first of all, thank you to, thank you to the, to the audience members for their question. Really good questions. It's for a lively discussion. Uh, I was so caught up in the discussion that at times I forgot to unmute myself before talking because I just really wanted to jump in there and, and, and sort of forward things on to the panelists. So um, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to ask the, the panelists to uh, to sort of send us out. And, and I think whatever final remarks you have, but really I, I think one thing the, the, the audience might want to hear right now is, was this all worth it? Did you, you know, how do you feel in retrospect about becoming a lawyer and becoming a public lawyer in particular? And uh, Matt, should I just say if we could start with you? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, unquestionably, this is the right choice for me. Um, I, um, I, I think a career in the public sector is incredibly rewarding. Um, it is not without its challenges, but um, there's really not a time in my life that I could see now spanning back since 1994 um, that I, I thought, like, what am I doing? Um, and, and there's opportunities that open up, uh, even in that world, um, that take you down a different path um, and uh, be receptive to those kinds of things. Um, because it's, I, I, I don't think it's possible for anyone to know. Maybe there's a rare uh, individual who knows from day one what they want to do. Um, and it's an evolution. It's, it's a, it, it goes to your character. Things happen to your life. Um, things happen around you that you respond to that might inspire you to do something and you should go with that because um, this is a practice, this is a profession, um, this is a job that uh, will grow with you and, um, and you will grow from it. So I, I definitely think it is um, a very laudable goal and for those of you that came out on a Saturday morning um, I commend you uh, for that um, because it is, uh, you've already started to think about what you want to do that will sustain you and not just be some temporary position or something that just pays bills. Um, and those are hard to find, uh, regardless of if it's the legal profession or otherwise. So um, I wish you the best. Uh, Jonathan, how about you? Uh, I consider myself lucky to go to work every day. Um, I guess we don't go to work anymore, but um, when we did, I was I was excited to get on board and, and head into the office. I consider myself privileged and, and uh, to do the work that I did. I find it incredibly fulfilling and incredibly rewarding. Um, so I'm, I, but that's specifically because I do public interest work um, that I think is helping to change the world and make it a better place. Uh, I will say though, the one caveat I have to add is that student debt is real. Um, and and the people who, uh, a public interest legal career is super rewarding if you can make the finances work. Um, I'm, I'm in a very privileged and lucky position where I can make the finances work, but people who are very close to me try to go into the public interest uh, public interest sector with $200,000 in debt or $150,000 in debt. And that debt is going to change when they can start a family and when they can buy a home and um, whether they can make certain career choices. And so the the financial realities of the legal sector today, um, 
are are impossible to ignore for for many of us. And so, um, uh, you have to if you want to pursue a public interest career, Godspeed. Um, it will be incredibly rewarding, but you have to plan very carefully. And you have to make very careful choices. And Genevieve, uh, your thoughts. So I've been a lawyer for just a year now. Uh, I passed the bar last year and recently graduated law school. So um, my advice I think, is interested in law school, but it's, yes, it's going to be very challenging. There may be times where you want to give up, and there are definitely times that I felt like that, especially after my first year. But it, what motivated me was my reason to go into law school, and that was to pursue an career in, in public, um, public interest and public service. And so that really has motivated me to work hard all throughout law school and definitely through the bar exam. That was like the, for me, the light at the end of the tunnel is, you know, getting my, my job as a deputy district attorney. So um, it's just been a year and it's already, you know, been very uh, rewarding. I, mean, I'm, I know I'm, I'm doing just misdemeanors right now, but it's still very, uh, I enjoy the challenges that come with it. Um, and I enjoy um, having to make difficult decisions that affect people's lives and with that you know I have the opportunity to really make a difference in the community and as a prosecutor you know your sole duty at the end of the day is to do what is right and so my advice is just to you know, pursue what you're passionate about and I think that will help you work hard and get through all the challenges that you're facing throughout law school in your, in your legal career. Thank you all so much to the panelists really appreciate your time on um, you know, on a Saturday morning. And again, to the audience members, I, I can't echo enough what Magic Judge say, the fact that you're willing to get out here at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, just to try to figure out what your dream is and to pursue it says a lot about you, um, speaks very highly of you. And um, I, I've been really honored to participate. I've had a lot of fun and uh, you know, thank you very much. Thank you everyone and have a great three day weekend. And thank you to our panel for your advice and insight. And to everyone, we hope you enjoyed today's session. Please join us next Saturday at 10 a.m. for session three, the Alternative Careers Panel, which will feature moderator Sean Tamurasato, who is a partner at Minami Tamaki, and panelist Kyung Kim, co-founder at Seesaw Kids, Alika Vafei, Director of Pro Bono and Strategic Partnerships at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area, and Allison Wong, Professor of Law and Director of the Externship Program at Golden Gate University School of Law. If you register for today's session on ABBA's website, you'll receive an email with a YouTube link to next Saturday's session. And if you haven't registered yet, please do so at our website, abba-bay.com forward slash pathways. We hope you'll join us for next week's panel and thank you for tuning in. <laughs>